I found it interesting myself that uh, OJ passed away this week as I was working on 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you might be thinking, what has that got to do with anything? Well, when I was a kid uh, in school, 1970s, uh, finished high school uh, just in the first six months of 1980, uh, my older brother and I, we just thought OJ was so cool. Uh, he was one of the uh, one of the only one of the only students of color in my high school was a guy named Chris, and Chris was also the star running back of our high school team. So everybody knew Chris as Juice, and that was about the coolest nickname anybody in the world could have. Um, we saw him uh, in commercials. He was in action movies and comedies. He had a role in what something that was pretty much the invention of a made-for-TV miniseries, uh, the adaption of Alex Haley's Roots. I remember watching that. I was in about grade nine, and everybody watched that series when it was on. And OJ comes in in his cameo, and he was like one of only about two actors in that whole series that you would recognize uh, from outside. This is what USA Today had to say about him, that Simpson was the first famous athlete to cross over into our culture in a massive way, to transcend sports, to become even more famous as a TV and movie star and corporate pitch man than he was as a football player, which is saying something because he won the Heisman Trophy, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Nowadays, it's expected that our biggest sports stars will pop up everywhere we look on commercials, all over TV, social media, creating their own clothing lines, sneakers, whatever, from LeBron James to Caitlin Clark, from Tom Brady to Serena Williams. It's now a staple of our sports fandom, but OJ started it all. Well, I'm convinced that uh, those things were, are one of the reasons why, 30 years later, many people continue to uh, believe he was an innocent man. And I think that most of the public had such a high admiration for the Hollywood OJ, we couldn't easily believe that he was capable of such wrong. Because we were, for the most part, so enamored with the qualities that he displayed. Um, I remember I was, watching, I was watching the Knicks trying to win the NBA championship when the famous slow-speed chase with the Bronco was happening. Well, all that to say, in 2 Corinthians, Paul has a huge challenge on his hand. And it's probably Marsha Clark-sized, if you remember that name. She was a woman trying to prosecute an American hero for double murder. Paul's not trying to solve a murder, but he's trying to... Uh, He's, he's not trying to protect his own popularity or promote his own brand, but he does perceive a very serious threat because these other teachers have come into this congregation in Corinth, and remember, he's far away. You don't have email. You don't have quick communication. You don't have a way to really communicate quickly, and he starts hearing the rumors about how this congregation is being led astray, and he perceives that as a Serious threat, which is why his tone in this section, we're in chapter 11 now of 2 Corinthians, seems really odd to us. Um, he uses a lot of irony. We're going to hear a lot of irony over the next three, two or three messages because Paul um, is using something that was considered a very persuasive form of rhetoric in his day and age. That was a time, if you remember from the fall, we talked about that was kind of the leading sport of the day. If you were a famous rhetorical speaker... Uh, people would pay good money and go and hear you and be amazed at how well you could speak. So that was a huge part of their culture. And Paul's battling with some alternative leaders, some alternate leaders, apostles small a, who had all the qualities admired in their day. And those were things like slick and impressive communication skills, add to that impressive, impressive appearance, wealth, very impressive credentials, and culturally, they, like O.J., would have been so highly admired and would have had such great influence over a crowd. So Paul has a difficult challenge, and he feels obligated in the passages we're going to look at in chapter 11, 12, and 13. He feels obligated to use the very tools that he's been accused of not being competent in, um, in his communication skills, or at least only having them in letters. Another angle I could use to set the pace is ask you parents, parents, have you ever been accused of overreacting, freaking out? I had a 
teenager in my home who, if you raise your voice slightly in an argument, was always very quick to say, okay, quit freaking out. I can't say which one of those daughters of mine that was. Matt knows which one it is. Anyhow, uh, overreacting is actually a perspective problem. Often kids think that folks are overreacting because the thing that the kids are doing or not doing is in their minds not a big deal. It's the small stuff. It's something they can handle. Parents, on the other hand, they have seen things. They've done things they wish they hadn't. They've not done things they wish they had. They've run out from behind parked cars with scissors and their mouth full. Or they know people who have. And they've seen the harm that it caused. So they raise their voices. Because they know the danger. Paul raises his voice in our passage, and it'll get even louder in the next few weeks. Because he realizes the danger that the congregation is headed toward. And again, to do this, he uses irony. Uh, I won't take the time to try and explain all the descriptions of first century teaching that I tried to wade through in the last week, uh, trying to make sense of uh, rhetorical methods of the day. Let me just say from what I've read, kind of calmly or expertly using irony, um, saying something but really meaning the opposite or using their words and really meaning the opposite is, was considered a very effective way to get into somebody's head, kind of like a Trojan horse of idea exchange. So that's apparently, according to the scholars, a lot of what Paul's doing here. So let's read, I'm going to just read the first 15 ch verses of chapter 11. And uh, it's actually, he's, this isn't even Paul's argument yet with the false teachers. In some ways, he's just setting up the rules of uh, how he's going to proceed. But there's some real nuggets in here that are worth looking at on their own this, this Sunday. So I'm going to start in verse 1 of chapter 11. I hope you will put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. But I don't consider myself inferior in any way to these super apostles who teach such things. I may be unskilled as a speaker, but I'm not lacking in knowledge. We have made this clear to you in every possible way. Was I wrong when I humbled myself? and honored you by preaching God's good news to you without expecting anything in return? I robbed other churches by accepting their contributions so I could serve you at no cost. And when I was with you and didn't have enough to live on, I did not become a financial burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia brought me all that I needed. I have never been a burden to you, and I never will be. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, no one in all of Greece will ever stop me from boasting about this. Why? Because I don't love you? God knows that I do. But I will continue doing what I've always done. This will undercut those who are looking for an opportunity to boast that their work is just like ours. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. Tough words. Uh, where's the irony come in? In verse 1, Paul says, he, he, Paul doesn't really think he's being foolish. Um, so he says, let me be foolish a little more. They think he's being foolish. In next week's passage, he'll take on the label of fool himself, and the, the irony is going to keep getting thicker and thicker. You're going to find over the next few weeks that Paul's going to boast about his sufferings and weaknesses. Uh, and we'll come back to that. And that's in contrast to these triumphant leaders who are kind of, hedging everything on their appearance of success. 
Uh, if you remember our met words a few weeks ago about the word triumph, we kind of focused on that whole cultural baggage around the word triumph. You know, if you think about Paul on the Damascus Road, that's one, that's one uh, part of Paul's life story that most of us have heard of and thought of. Uh, unlike those triumphal entries where the conquering hero and general comes into the city gates among a giant parade, Paul's road to Damascus can be seen as like an ironic triumphal procession of its own. Only instead of being the triumphant one, Paul was triumphed over. That's what happened to him. He was on his way to a looking for success, and he was triumphed over by Christ. This, this is uh, some of the ideas that are going to keep coming up over and over again in these passages. Um, Paul fights his opponents not by showing how victorious and successful he appears, but considers his sufferings, like Christ's sufferings, to be validating of his legitimate ministry. Here's a quote from a biblical scholar, Witherington, who has a, a really good commentary on First and Second Corinthians. And um, paraphrasing the first line here to make sense of uh, the quote that I took. Paul's life story parodies the images of what it means to be truly heroic in a culture saturated with Roman imperial propaganda and eschatology, their version of how things are going to work out. The Corinthians, this is the line that really grabbed me, the Corinthians were still too enamored with these images of leadership that their culture, rather than the image of Christ, had long been feeding them. Let me reread that last in that line. The Corinthians were still too enamored with these images of leadership that their culture, rather than the image of Christ, had long been feeding them. Maybe it's appropriate while we have this message on this topic today that the Lord's table is sitting right in front of this pulpit. And we know we're going to end here because this, this is a vision of leadership right here in front of us, isn't it? Maybe by writing what Paul does about foolishness, maybe when he starts out this way in verse 1, he's kind of putting the congregation on their back feet, sort of like, uh, you know, maybe you would known a scenario at work where somebody saw an email that they shouldn't have, and then they're able to quote that email in a discussion, and people are like, oh, wait, you weren't supposed to hear that. Maybe that's a little bit of what's going on here when Paul says, oh, let me be foolish with you a little longer. People in Corinth might have thought, oh, obviously it got to Paul that we were calling him foolish. So why is Paul so concerned about the influence of these other teachers? There's a lot of reasons. I'm going to try to cover some of them, not necessarily in order. Number one, they've been deceived. If you look in verse 3, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Personally, I wouldn't build a whole theology of ministry or or women from these verses about Eve, uh, the passage, uh, Paul is really speaking about Satan. And Satan showed his cards many, many, many years ago in that incredibly primal account of the fall of mankind. Deception has been dangerous ever since the Garden of Eden. Uh, here's like one, one uh, definition of uh, deception that I pulled up. Um, if you can go to that one, Cindy. Deception, to cause a person to believe something that's not true, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. That's definitely what Paul's after in this letter. Uh, it also means to give a mistaken impression of something. You know, that's where we get the expression, looks can deceive. Uh, to fail to admit to yourself that something is true. That's what we call self-deception. And according to Paul, deception was eating at the foundation that he, as a capital A apostle, had laid in this congregation. Um, it, it, it's a deception in Christian teaching that it's, it's away from Christ. And we see that where he says, I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Notice that he's not afraid that their pure and undivided devotion to Paul is going to be corrupted, that their pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. They're being tempted to turn away from the true discipleship to Christ. Now, in the letter to Galatians, this is one of the things we have to be careful of as we try to figure out, you know, what it is that these guys were teaching. In, in Galatians, it's pretty clear what the false teaching is that Paul deals with there. That's another sermon series. It could be the same thing here, something I love Scott's expression he used a few sermons ago, like it could have been that make Judaism great again, 
um, that whole tendency that kept coming up in the early church to bring back all of the law codes and all of those restrictions. That might have been it, um, but Paul doesn't really name it here. And, and I think there's some genius about that. Uh, the good thing about not knowing what is specifically is wrong in this case is we might dismiss other false teachings as not as important because it doesn't get listed um, like this. I, I speak often, I, I use the expression Jesus plus programs and, and warn you about those. I don't usually spell out exactly what I mean by that. But it's, it's any kind of a distortion of discipleship where it's Jesus plus some other secret ingredient that's needed. You know, I don't usually label it because if I say, you know, Jesus plus some specific prayer or spiritual discipline method, um, or if I say Jesus plus some specific view of the end times, then you might think, well, Jesus plus strict observance of the Sabbath isn't such a big deal. Uh, in Paul's words, pure and undivided devotion to Christ, that could stand for a description of what a church is trying to do in its efforts at discipleship. I think it would be a really good one. But what are you trying to grow in your people or in your congregation? Pure and undivided devotion to Christ. Um, these, these deceivers are somehow guilty of presenting a more appealing view of discipleship than that. And while doing so, they presented themselves as eloquent, bold, polished, self-confident, and they were leading people from Christ. Paul revealed in this passage, he's trying to set people up with Christ. Paul's trying to set people up with Jesus. They're leading him away. Because whenever you add something to, you're, you're already admitting that the thing itself isn't enough. I, I remember Eugene Peterson saying, any prefix, when, when you add a prefix to the meaning of the word, you somehow demean the meaning of the word, you know? So it's like, like uh, assistant pastor. <laughs> uh, you know, new worship, um, all of that kind of thing. Well, they're adding something to the basic discipleship. It's really diminishing it. In verses 3 to 4, you see the reason for raising his voice is that turning from Christ leads to malnutrition, malnourishment. We could say stunted growth or growth defects in a congregation. So Paul turns to the marriage metaphor to explain his own ministry goals. Uh, in verse 2, Paul said he promised the Corinthians to Jesus. That's what I mean about setting them up with Jesus. Um, which means by being led astray, they're guilty of spiritual, they're at risk of spiritual unfaithfulness to Jesus. You know, previously in 2 Corinthians, Paul's pictured himself as a, the, the slave of a conquering general. If you remember way back in chapter 2, we talked about those victory parades. And Paul saw himself as one of the Enemy that's at the back of the chain, one of the least significant of all the prizes that the champion was bringing into the city. Paul says, I'm at the back of that line. I was, I was overcome by Jesus. He called himself just a whiff of Jesus, the aroma of Christ in chapter 2, verse 15. He called himself Jesus' message delivery service in chapter 3, verse 3. He called himself as Jesus' ambassador in chapter 5, verse 20. A couple weeks ago, we saw him as a fortress conqueror and a hostage taker in chapter 10. And now he's a dating service or a matchmaker. There are many trees that gave up their life in order to write all of the books that you would need to read to really grasp the differences in marriage and marriage ceremonies and marriage culture in the first century compared to today. I mean, you'd have to get into all kinds of things like arranged marriages, first century purity culture, and, and even Paul's words here is he describes himself as some kind of best man, right, that we just read. Well, <laughs> growing up in this culture, uh, I think I was the best man once or twice. And, and it says something that I'm not even sure if I was, <laughs> like at my own brother's wedding, because I'm pretty sure I didn't do anything. Uh, you know, at your best, like it's kind of like honorary best friend is almost what best man means in our culture. Once in a while, maybe they'll actually do some work. In Paul's day, there seems to have been a whole bunch of things. Like, it's so far from us to think that this groomsman, this best man, had some kind of moral authority over the freedom and movement of the bride. Like, that's pretty weird. You know, it, it, it's almost like he's describing here that this man had, had some... Uh, 
kind of authority over a bride's social activities in order to protect her reputation, purity, or to fend off would-be challengers, challengers trying to hit on the bride. So, so this is a pretty big role that Paul's talking about in this allegory that he used. It's an amazing allegory when you part it all out and you figure out the roles and identity of the characters. The fiancé is the church. Paul's saying to this church in Corinth, that's, that's who I want you to, that's how I want you to think of yourself. Now, being betrothed, being engaged in the first century, way, way more significant than it is in our day and age. I mean, it, it was a serious relationship. The wedding hadn't come yet, but you're spoken for, taken. It's, it's going in that direction. That becomes your identity at that point. Um, the fiance is the church. The husband soon to arrive is Jesus. And the matchmaker here, or the best man, or the groomsman, is the evangelist apostle. And what's Paul alert, alarmed at with this congregation? He's alarmed at the level of flirting that the bride-to-be is participating in with a different Jesus, or at least a different one from the one they preached. They're dangerously close to being unfaithful to the real Jesus. That's another connection with that Garden of Eden story that we heard about. Um, that the, the, the snake's cunning we read about led Eve astray. And these false teachers, they're hitting on Jesus' fiance, and their trickery was in their message. Some kind of alternative gospel, false gospel, a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. If you have a Bible on you, pick it up right now and hold it. You know, we, we don't have a YouTube feed of the false messages and messed up messages of these preachers. Sadly, there's a gazillion hours of it on YouTube nowadays. We don't have that. So we can't watch that video and then watch some YouTube videos of Paul's preaching in order to figure out, well, what's the real, what's the real deal and what's the false deal? The good news is we got this. We have the writings. We have the apostles' writings. So when we talk about the opportunity to learn how to study your Bible on Wednesday nights, this is a pretty big and important thing in life. It's a pretty big part of the Christian life not just to have a Bible, but to read a Bible and to learn how to read it, how to study it. Um, I, I remember reading statistics a long time ago about, you know, we like to brag as Christians how the Bible outsells every other book year after year after year. And yeah, and then people have like 12 of them in their house, often just collecting dust. Um, it's so easy for us to have a Bible, to give away Bibles, to, to spread the Bible. It's it's never been real easy to read it. it. And it's not an easy thing to, to suss out genuine truth from God's word. So there are things to learn about how to read your Bibles. And uh, we just want to kind of make that point. It's been preserved. Their writings have been preserved remarkably. And we want to help you understand it because of the role that it plays in pure and undivided devotion to Christ. Another reason Paul's Raising his voice is because these intruders are intentionally undermining his influence and credibility in Corinth. The, the word that they use for Paul is that he was an idiotes. <laughs> that sounds pretty familiar to a word we use. It really means an unskilled as a speaker, means not polished, he's just an amateur. And they're basically saying, are you going to believe someone that sounds like that? It, it may be why in this letter in 2 Corinthians, there are so many literary patterns that are part of the technical, rhetorical argument culture because Paul's being accused of lacking those kinds of skills. Remember he said, I'm not we, we've shown you that we know what we're talking about. Um, he's defending that. It, it, if it was bad enough that Paul was a mere tradesman, tent maker, perhaps he also sounded like one. If you think about the setup for being a tent maker, we talked about this early on in the series, what that really meant. You know, it meant kind of an open air under a canopy that Paul probably built for himself. He could travel with just a few knives and hand tools, and then he could go places and buy hides and material, and he could use his special techniques for making waterproof membranes and canopies that he could sell to people, but it was like in a hot culture, in a temporary shelter. So 
Lots of tradesmen would be coming in and out, and while Paul's working away with his leather as a working guy, he's having all kinds of conversations because we know he was an evangelist. And you just think about what would you learn about that? Um, you know, uh, you, you, some of you I know are dedicated people sharing your faith, and you do it at work. You know, so you you have to realize, hmm. This is even harder than having this conversation out in Sunday school with children because this person I'm talking to has no idea what I'm talking about. You know, some of the questions Janine's friends ask her at church, I'm at church, sorry, at at work, blows her mind. That's what little uh, amount of knowledge adults in Canada have about the Christian faith. And so you find yourself having to take these complicated terms and explain them in a way that an average working person with little background can understand. Paul has got probably developed fantastic skills as a tradesman in a work environment, sharing his faith with people in that way. And he took that same skill into the pulpit, I think. People think that saying complicated things in a simple way is easy. It's quite complicated. It's funny how we'll praise teachers that can break things down and make them easy to understand, but sometimes we'll look down our nose at preachers that do the same. Because we kind of like, oh, that was really, I don't, didn't understand it, but it sure sounded profound. Or they had a British accent. That's what we always joke about. And that just made it sound so deep. And Paul's being accused here. Well, guess what? Paul's saying, my goal is not impression. My goal is clarity. Uh, that's my goal when I'm preaching. I need to stop preaching and get back to my notes here right now. Um, Paul's goal was clarity, not impression. And then the money question comes in in verses 7 down to 11. I have to keep moving here. And it's in the same category of attack over Paul's authority. Without spending all afternoon in a history of patronage in the first century world, some background is needed. We'll hear people railing in the media and on social media about the one percenters and and the inequity of of wealth. And in this, the problem here and... This day and age is such a small number of people have all the money and the rest of us have nothing. And there's reality to that. But get in a time machine and go back to the first century because you ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) Talk about the few having all the power and esteem and status. In fact, that kind we've talked about this in our messages, that kind of status of you're at this level and this person's under you and has to ask for all the permission moving up and this, this class is under you and this class is under you. Sometimes we use really kind of silly language and we describe ourselves as working like slaves because uh, inflation's gone so sky high and wages haven't or interest rates or taxes or whatever it is come back in the first century and half the people our slaves. And not only that, it was expected that this is how things had to be in order for society to work. This is what it was built on. That's how the gods are all structured, and this is our society reflecting what goes on in the heavens with all of our gods and all their status and all of that. All into that is this idea of patronage. The people with the wealth would be patrons. We, we don't use the word patronage usually in a positive way very often. It's connected with that word patronizing. Don't patronize me. Um, we resent it because somebody above or it's acting like they're above and talking to you. Well, this is part of their society. We have patrons of the arts. And that just means some guy's so rich he can just throw money at museums and hospitals and get his name on the wall. And that's like a patron of the arts. If you go into... Sick Kids Hospital, I mentioned that they have that beautiful uh, high um, what is it, entranceway. I don't even know what you would call it. And, and it's like huge, beautifully sculpted names of all the donors that have paid for certain floors. That's, that's patronage, okay? In this society, you usually required a patron. If you were an artist or a writer or a, 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 some kind of, uh, even some tradesman, you had a patron. And you kind of rode their coattails. And then there was even status of levels of patronage. And, well, my patron is more impressive and more famous and more powerful than yours. And then all of this kind of stuff. But here's the other thing about patronage. Definitely, it came with strings attached. Um, I, I found a quote that said, whoever gives much wants much in return. And the people that received patronage were called clients. And in the ancient world, a lot of ancient literature portrays clients as groveling 
flattering yes men at the beck and call of their patron. And definitely in the first century, the client was not always right. But based on what you can imagine, you can imagine why Paul wouldn't want patronage then. Because you think about all of those strings that are attached. Um, but it's not quite that simple. Because Paul did accept money from churches. We already read that. I had nothing. The people from Macedonia, who, by the way, were probably a lot poorer than the Corinthians were, they gave me everything I needed. I've been supported by other churches. I've never taken a dime for you. That seems insulting to these people. Remember I talked about that idea of the patron is up here and the one receiving it is down below. So it was really not culturally cool to refuse patronage because you're below the person giving it and now you're insulting someone that's above you. So Paul is kind of being accused of, you think you're too good for our money. You think you're above us. Uh, that's a lot of what's going on in the background. But, but Paul, like I said, he took money from other churches. So what's going on here? Paul knew in this particular instance, it would have confused the relationship and the gospel message if he were to take money from these people because he understands how kind of Roman and, and how much they're still soaked in the popular culture around them. It would be not the right thing to do in this situation. And his little time out... We're not apostles. We can't do apples to apples all the time in this argument of Paul's. But there is a universal principle there for every Christian. And it's this. Sometimes in the Christian life, you need to give up what's your right in order to do what's right. You don't always hold on to, well, that's, it's legit. It's within my right to request this or expect that from some people. Sometimes, this is this whole other censored kind of lifestyle. You have to put those things away, and Paul's doing that here. And the, cult, the uh, congregation's insulted, and uh, Paul, he's playing a complicated game of Christian value clarification, but he doesn't leave them in the dark about his motives. One of their mistakes is reading his motives through the lens of their culture, so he corrects them clearly here. This is also a, couple of, it's a correction and a rebuke when he tells them how much he loves them. We, we read that. He said, because I, I'm, I'm not taking your money because I don't love you, God knows that I do. Now, people, throws, people throw uh, the Lord's name around really easily in our culture. Well, God knows I'm telling the truth. Or I swear by God that I'm telling the truth. Somebody like Paul wouldn't do that easily. So when Paul says to them, and puts it in writing, God knows that I love you. If that is not true, Paul is guilty of blaspheming the name of God. He's in an argument defending his role as an apostle, and he puts in writing, God knows that I love you. We should always bend over backwards to make sure that part of any kind of argument or thing that we're doing is, is made clear. And Paul does that here. Uh, I can't spend more time on this one issue, but just let me draw attention to the point that even in the first century, money was a conflict in the early church. It was here. This, this, there's a power struggle, isn't there? Uh, quick story. I remember in uh, the, my church in Brantford, uh, where I worked before here, uh, we had this beautiful sign. Beautiful sign. It's kind of like the one there with the flip over, um, you know, uh, wheel of fortune letters that you went and switched uh, the messages all the time. But this one was really nice. It was big, had a beautiful brick thing around it, flowers in it, and four or five guys, the old guard, had donated the money for that sign. And when they donated the money, there was the warning, you know, it's just for sermon titles and scripture, not for quaint sayings or anything kind of humorous. And Steve's dad wanted to put an announcement about a thing coming up, and he ran into this thing, kind of caught him, what? It was, it, they said what when they gave the money for this sign? Yeah, you're not allowed to use it for this, that, or the other reasons. So Steve's dad said something genius at that meeting. He goes, how much did it cost them <laughs> for the sign? Let's, let's buy the sign. Like, we'll buy the sign then so that we can use it. Paul's kind of fighting against the giving here because of those strings that get attached sometimes with money. His parting shot they're pretty hard here in verses 12 to 15. These pretenders want to be seen as equal to the apostles 
And it's curious, we're gonna see more of it in the coming messages, so this is just a, a teaser right now for where we're going. The pretenders wanna be seen as equal to the apostles, and the way Paul is willing to suffer is gonna show them up. That's what's gonna pull the rug out from under them and undercut them, because he knows it's going to show them up. He has harsh words here, false apostles, deceitful workers, that they're in costumes or they're disguised. Does it remind you of someone? How about someone we've already mentioned, Satan in the garden? And Paul comes back to him again here. He says, no wonder his servants use the same ta tactics. Now, we really got to be careful about throwing out false apostle, Satan's servant title at any and, at any and every other preacher, denomination, author with which we may disagree. We don't know for sure what they're preaching. We're not apostles. It's not directly apples to apples for your local church leaders to go after the authors, celebrity pastors, multimedia influencers that they might find undermining their authority. But having said that, think about if you have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You're here this morning and there might be a lot of things you don't know about the Christian life, but you know you are saved. You know that on judgment day, God's gonna see in you the righteousness of Christ because what he did on the cross for you, by faith you've put your entire hope on what he did for you. You've repented of your sin, trying to do it your own way, and it's like, I need a savior. I'm placing my faith in Christ. Okay, so, so you have that going for you. And... Uh, All of these other uh, authors, and they're, 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 how did that come to you? That's what I was going. Well, it came to you, that message, that saving message, I'm sorry, I got lost there, came to you in a very long, very long um, relay race. A baton was passed for 2,000 years before it arrived to you. It was dependent upon the Holy Spirit to bring you to life, certainly, but one faithful servant like Paul was faithful to his calling. He discipled people, leading them toward pure and undivided devotion to Christ and encouraged them to share the same message with others. And they shared it with someone and again and again and again. And there are so many links in a long chain of true witnesses that you start to see why Paul has been raising his voice in this passage. Because truth matters. Truth matters. Deception is dangerous. Anything that leads from Christ as the center of your entire world, let alone your theology or your beliefs about salvation, is leading you away from the one place where you'll find hope. And it's not always easy to figure out. I stumbled across a, a piece, an article, that talked about the 90s TV series, The X-Files, which I didn't even watch. I had a friend who was really a big fan through the 90s, and I knew the name Agent Mulder, and that was about all I knew about it. But in one passage, in one episode, in the seventh season, no biblical significance there, in the seventh season, there's this episode where there were all these suspicious deaths in this one town by snake bite. And uh, the, path, the, the episode was called Signs and Wonders, by the way. So there's all these people dying by snake bite. They go in to investigate, and all the suspicion in the episode focus on the pastor of this little backwater, intolerant, snake-handling church. Now, snake-handling Baptists, is, is a, that was a thing, and it's, it's often used as a, it's just like a slur of the lowest level of fundamentalist you can imagine, those crazy snake-handling Baptists. So this pastor of this little backwater, considered hateful, intolerant church, he's the one that's the cause of all of this death, right? But in the story... Surprisingly, in the episode, the real culprit was the pastor of the tolerant, upper-class, successful mainline church. And after a final confrontation with the star, Agent Mulder, this, this uh, kind of imposter, he actually transforms into a snake and snithers off to only end up back in another church somewhere else where he's described as pastoring with an open and modern way of looking at God. Where's all this going? Mulder says in the episode, believe it or not, I wrote this quote down directly. People think the devil has horns and a tail. 
They're not looking for some kindly man who tells you what you want to hear. Let me read that again. I kind of read it off because that second sentence is still talking about the devil. People think the devil has horns and a tail. They're not looking for some kindly man who tells you what you want to hear. I think Paul would have been a fan of the X-Files, at least that episode anyway, because it seems to fit what he's talking about here, doesn't it? Uh, we're going to pick up this argument because it's going to get hotter and harder and more ironic and more direct, but there's time for that next week. We're, we're moving now to the Lord's table. And uh, it's not a big jump from where we've been talking. I talked about it at the beginning. We're going to hear... Uh, a lot in the future messages about suffering as validation and uh, real strength, chapters 11 to 13. Let me read some words from uh, the second chapter of Philippians. Just as you prepare your heart, think about the description of this leader and what pure uh, devotion to Christ looks like. Philippians chapter 2. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? This is still Paul writing, by the way, and the answer to that question is yes. He's not being ironic now. He says, any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Now, when Paul says that, he's still talking about the gospel, isn't he? He's not just talking about any kind of group effort we could put together. Don't be 